Good morning, and welcome to the University of Oklahoma today. I am Kathleen Brosnan, the Paul and Doris Eaton Travis Chair of Modern American History here at the University of Oklahoma. Um, like all my colleagues, I'm so pleased that you could join us here today at the University of Oklahoma for the annual teach-in, this year focusing on the Western Frontier. Let's, I wanted to also thank Dr. Elliot West again uh, for the opening session and that terrific talk. It's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, Patty Limerick, Patricia Limerick, uh, who I first met about 20 years ago at Chicago's Newberry Library. Dr. Limerick is the author of Desert Passages and The Legacy of Conquest, as well as A Ditch in Time, The City, the West, and Water, A History of Water in Denver. Professor Limerick has also served as a guest columnist for the New York Times and an op-ed columnist for the Denver Post. She is a professor of history at the University of Colorado and the director of the Center for the American West. She asked me to mention that while maintaining a neutral position on the issues, the Center for the American West has launched a new program called Fracking Sense, an attempt, <laughs> an attempt to create a forum where issues surrounding this form of energy development can be discussed. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Limerick. Thank you. Thank you very much for this occasion. Thank you, President Boren. Thank you, all the folks who organized this great event. Thank you for including me in such a distinguished lineup of speakers. It is an honor to be in that list. My top title suffers from excessive ambition, water in the West, in something short of two days, which would be the, uh, probably the appropriate length. I will use a, the case study with which I am most familiar, the history of water in the Denver area, but I will aim at that case study at drawing bigger conclusions for the larger subject. In the interest of time, I have left out some of my most important pieces of advice drawn from history. So for instance, if you pay cl close attention to the history of water management in the West, that gives you one clear historical lesson to offer to the citizens of the United States, really, not just the West. We are really in need of a better social relationship between engineers and American society. For years, we have had American society saying to the profession of engineers, here's what you're to do. You're to get us the commodities and services we want. You are to supply them in an utterly reliable way. You are to supply them to us at low cost. And you had better make sure to keep any costs and consequences and disturbances that come from producing those results. You had better make sure to keep those out of our view will be very upset. <laughs> so the historical lesson is a delightful historical lesson, which is the Limerick uh, law here, that if state legislators would consider this, it would be good. Just a pleasant, good-natured law that says that in a state, in a particular state, no dinner party is complete until you have included an engineer in the guest list. Are there engineers in the room who would support this? So, well, there's at least, we've got one dinner guest, there are three or four really ready to go there. So uh, the dinner guests will be available afterwards for invitations on, on that. Um, the subject is very much focused on the Colorado example and the west, west of the 100th meridian. One of its agenda items, I'm sorry to say, I love Elliot's talk. It was a wonderful talk. And part of my work has been on water to maybe not let California be such a center stage hog in the story of water. Uh, California, I am originally from California. I, it's history. Everything that Elliot told us, I certainly stand by and applaud. But on the matter of water, as I'll explain in a moment, I'm not certain that California is exactly where we should have our attention focused. And I guess I will apologize for a fact that can't much, there's not much to be done about it, that my focus is on the West, on the 
drier side of the 100th meridian, and so your panhandle is cool and in my subject matter, and then the rest of your state is a little too wet in many years for fitting in my case study. But I look forward to many conversations in the course of the day from people who can get me better acquainted on the situation of water in this state. So here we are. This is a very commonly seen graphic that shows this 100th meridian uh, and its meaning. If you are having trouble finding a pattern in this map, you should see an ophthalmologist very soon. This is not particularly subtle here. You can see that the rainfall is much lighter on the western side of the 100th meridian. So the lighter the area, the less the annual precipitation. Then that gets us to an interesting matter of people in a present moment attempting to interpret the world about, around them and predict outcomes. Uh, these are the two first explorers of the Front Range region, the Colorado, uh, what became Colorado, Zebulon Pike and Stephen Long. And when they came to, this re to that region, they were really quite knocked over by the aridity the openness of the landscape, the scarcity of trees, just the general dryness. Of course, in order to get there, they had to travel when the plains were sufficiently unmudified. That's not a technical term, the soil geologists don't use that, but they had to wait for the uh, plains to become travelable, so they could not get to the Front Range region until it was midsummer, mid or late summer. So they thought it was very dry. They saw stream channels, and for whatever reason, their minds weren't stirred by that. They didn't think, well, if there are stream beds with very little water or no water, does that mean that there might be something that happens when we're not here? So they didn't really get the notion that there might be uh, more water in the late spring and early summer. But anyways, it looked very, very dry to them. So they were uh, really of one mind in thinking, this won't work. The term the Great American Desert came out of that perception, the notion that this region of the Front Range of Colorado was simply too dry to support conventional American settlement. Well, that was their judgment. Now, you'd think that would make, <clears throat> make them sad. If you were a federal agent and you have come to assess the resources of an unsettled land, you would think that you would feel under obligation to say, I went there and it was great and there will be wonderful opportunities. So it is a little bit amusing to realize that both Zebulon Pike and Stephen Long came to a different mood or a different tone or a different emotion. To them, what they saw in the dryness of that region was good news. And they reported it with cheer. Now I hope you're weirded out by that now, thinking what, what came over them? Worn down by a long trip, becoming a little witless there. On the contrary, what they saw, and remember, this is, uh, the, the expeditions are, well, 1806 with, with Pike and Stephen Long in the 18, uh, late 1810s. It's a new nation. It's an experiment. It's a uh, democratic republic. Nobody knows how big a democratic republic can be before it is too big, before you have overstretched the idea of a democratic republic by just too much geographic space. So both Pike and Long and Edwin James, who wrote for the Long Expedition, thought they had found good news in this limitation. Our citizens so prone to rambling, Pike said, will now be kept within boundaries. They will have to stay closer to the, uh, to the Mississippi River and the Missouri River. They will have to stay out of this territory. And thus, our nation would be constrained to a manageable size and not overextended. So the good news of that, and then interestingly, another piece of good news they th both thought, this land, because white Americans won't want it, offers a solution to the Indian dilemma. Because the whites don't want it, this can be where the Indians can be removed and kept, kept there. So both of them reported back with some cheer, but they reported back with some certainty that this land would not be a place where Americans could settle. They don't look like the best prophets on that count. Uh, but prophecy is hard, and we'll get back at the very end to evaluating that prophecy. Well, here's a counterintuitive income to get at how poorly their prophecy worked out. This 
is a map that shows the uh, darker the color, the greater per capita water use in that area. So the driest area has the heaviest per capita per person, in other words, water use. That hasn't changed dramatically. Uh, it's a 1990 graphic, but it hasn't changed all that much. So that's kind of mysterious. How come the driest place has the heaviest water use? And here's the answer. The, this is a map that shows, this is again, I'm sorry you're left out of that, I apologize for that, but you were on the wrong side of the 100th meridian, most of your state is for getting on this map. The green bar here is the amount of water going to agriculture, and the blue part is industrial and municipal uses. So the high per capita use comes from the fact that in, in, our, in my state, in Colorado, 85% of the water still goes to agriculture. And thus, that per capita use goes, goes way up because of farming. It, this is also an interesting graphic because when people say we are running out of water in the Rocky Mountain West or the interior West, you can see there there's a tremendous potential for agricultural water transfers, moving the water from ag into, into municipal use, if we choose that. There's no reason why we should or should not choose that, but it's uh, not quite a matter of just running out. So here is my case study. This is... Uh, a project writing about the history of the Denver Water Department, which seems like an incredibly dreary topic. <laughs> but that's my dilemma these days, is I'll explain that in a, in a moment. And here, boo-hoo, here is the main character of my book. There are people in my profession who write biographies of Abraham Lincoln, who write by, I mean, David McCullough has spoken to you. Look at his subject matter. Look at the fascinating individuals. And this is my main character. <laughs> does that seem fair? No, it does not. Uh, there's a lot of drama in this story. What you can see here, and I don't want to dwell on it, but you can see the continental divide uh, that wiggly line through the middle of the map there, that's the Continental Divide, and you can see two areas, uh, the Moffat Collection System and the Delta Collection Basin, where water is taken from the western slope of Colorado, the western side of the state, and transported by tunnels to the Front Range, and in fact then distributed in the Denver metropolitan region. So that's really all I'd ask you to uh, notice, but I'd also ask you to notice that's a really tangled and difficult literary problem. So here is my life uh, in one slide. I went from writing about Western American tales of passion and struggle in history to the topics of bureaucracy and infrastructure. If I go to a cocktail party and someone says to me, well, what are you working on these days, Patty? And I say, oh, bureaucracy and infrastructure. They say, I see an old friend over there. I've got to go. <laughs> say hello to. And that, to me, is unfortunate because bureaucracy and infrastructure, as I hope I can make the case, there is real intense human interest in that. And even if there weren't, it's our lives. It's what we rest on. So this is my new term. Uh, please join me in making this a household phrase. We're not moving too fast on this, but instead of terms like the progressive era, the gilded age, or so on, I'm trying to get this for the last century. The arrival of the era of improbable comfort made possible by a taken for granted but truly astonishing subject matter. <laughs> the fourth time you say it, it just rolls off your tongue. <laughs> and it helps us understand a great deal about the last century but also about our lives today. Working on urban water is different from writing about uh, the Bureau of Rec Reclamation or classic agricultural water stories. And one reason it's different is that a classic movie with very little historical content that it was made by a man with what well, you could say uncertain moral character, you could say creepy moral character, that classic movie still exercises an astounding amount of influence over popular thinking about Western urban water today. I've never really seen anything quite like it. For people who have seen this movie, of which I think there will be a number in the room, but you will be enlightened in ways that these other people are not, at this very moment, you'll start off better because we've already talked about the filmmaker. Anyway, people feel that they know what they need to know about Western urban uh, water history because they saw that movie. In other words, somebody writing about the history of urban water has to take on 
Chinatown. When you think about Roman Polanski's private life, you think, why in heaven's name would people give him authority over their understanding of the past? But it is amazing how people think that they know what they need to know once they've seen that, that movie. I'll just say that the events that occur in that movie um, occurred in the 1910s. The, the, the Owens Valley Aqueduct was finished in the 1910s. Because Roman Polanski needed a creepy detective scenario, he had to put the movie in the 1930s. Now, how is that going to work out for historical accuracy? Is that going to work well? So anyway, uh, for whatever reason, that has been unavoidable to, for somebody working on this topic to run into that. So here is a very, very quick journey through, through the big story here. Uh, I want to make sure I use this one quotation, that the Denver area did not seem promising. I'm so glad President Boren started off with that characterization of the Norman area when the first president of the university came to visit. Denver might have been worse. It was uh, stark and treeless and, and just looked very dry and discouraging. There was a minister, a Presbyterian minister, who came to visit the area in 1863 before the, was just founded, the city was just founded in 1859. So a Presbyterian minister uh, encapsulated the dismay that Americans felt when they saw Denver setting. This minister was overcome at a church service. He had planned to have one hymn sung, but when he traveled to this church service and looked at the landscape, he asked the congregation to change their page in the hymnal and to sing a hymn entitled, Lord, What a Wretched Land Is This? And here's one of the great paradoxes of Western water. Uh, scarcity, aridity, summer dryness, runoff, gone away by the time the, the greatest need is there, but also periods of excess. This is the flood in the 1860s in Denver. It had seemed to be so convenient to build along the banks of Cherry Creek and the South Platte. And then, of course, um, well, actually, one of the interesting buildings that got that was placed really right on the edge of the riverbed was the Rocky Mountain News. So they were silenced for a phase um, and came back. So, but it is astounding to look at how rapidly that town grew. I mean, this is less than 30 years after the founding of a really ragtag town. And it is, of course, water supply that is making that possible. By the 1870s, really, visitors were coming to Denver and saying, it is such a place of green landscapes. We see yards and gardens there. Now, the American people have a thing about the color green. And it's very deeply wired. And so one of the most improbable uses of language in human society is that environmentalists who want nature as much as possible kept intact and on its own terms, they call themselves the Greens. In the Rockies, you should be the olive greens at the least, or you should probably be the tans or the, the browns. Green is a sign that in, in our region of the Rockies, green is a sign that human beings have come and disturbed the landscape, have changed it. The Bureau of Reclamation has been there. Somebody's been there. So quite a thing to see the word green and its power. So at a certain point, um, even though private companies were bringing in a water supply and competing fiercely among themselves, they were not doing well at managing human health issues. So typhoid would rip through the Denver population because like most newly created American communities, it's really an astonishing pattern, the sewage facilities, sanitation facilities, were just intermingled with the fresh water supply. And so, and very, and different jurisdictions, very little attention, um, actually all, no jurisdiction in some cases, just chaos. So something had to be done to improve the water quality, and that was probably the primary impetus for consolidating companies uh, and creating the Denver Union Water Company, which could then start the project of heading up into the mountains to get a fresher supply of water that was not contaminated by proximity to human settlement. Here is Cheeseman, Dam Cheeseman Canyon. They are uh, doing what engineers do, which is thinking, well, here's a dam waiting to happen. We got walls, just need that, that plug. And here is Cheeseman Dam, completed in 1905. And here is what Cheeseman Dam looks like from the base. They obviously did some very interesting engineering of sculpting that dam into the rocks. 
There's a movement in the United States called land art, where you take a natural setting and put human structures into it. Uh, in some cases, they're well, the, the, uh, the artist Christo is the most famous for putting, putting the, he wants to put a great set of curtains over a river in, in Colorado. So because I'm familiar with this land art movement, when I stood at the base of that dam, Cheeseman Dam, first I had a heretical thought for somebody from Boulder, Colorado. I thought, this dam is beautiful. And then I thought, Really, the way it is sculpted in there, it looks just like the classic definition of land art, human structure playing off natural setting. So I th have a hypothesis, which is not very sound, which is that a hundred and more years ago, there was a profession of people who wanted to be land artists, but the National Endowment for the Arts didn't exist, big patrons didn't exist, and so they had to be civil engineers <laughs> and build these things. That's not really convincing. So... Uh, I'm, in case you fear we're going to have to do the whole history, we're not going to have to do the whole history, but I do want to pause and just take you into this man's character for a moment because he was the public face of the Denver Water Board for years. The Denver Water Board came into existence in 1918 when they bought the company that had built Cheeseman Dam. And in, uh, from really the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, this man who was in office through much of that time, not all of that time, was the symbol of the Denver Water Board and showing you a little bit about this man, Glenn Saunders, who is not known in our, in our community. I think you could, we could walk down the Denver 16th Street Mall for days before we would find anybody who recognized this man's name, even though I think he was probably the most important figure in making Denver possible. Anyway, uh, Glenn Saunders was the ultimate water buffalo who, and he was so interesting as a person that when I tried to subordinate him into the chapters, chronological chapters, I couldn't make that happen. He's such an interesting character. So here we have, here's Mr. Saunders. He was an attorney. He was a Shakespearean actor as a young man. He was a, a very strong character. And I will now prove to you what I can only do in a quick glimpse, but you will now fully believe me when I say this was quite a character. He was determined that Denver's growth was the major goal for the state of Colorado, that if Denver was thriving, it really didn't matter what happened anywhere else. He was a fierce litigator. He was a brilliant trial attorney and so on. Now, let's give this a concrete example. I'm going to tell you a story about an occasion where Saunders was taking a deposition and he was badgering the person who he was interviewing because that person had not been born in Colorado and was therefore an outsider and had no right to have a position on water policy, uh, water development. So the attorney representing the sort of badgered witness jumped in and he said to Glenn Saunders, since you insist that a person must be born here in order to have standing as a decision maker, a credible person. Did your ancestors ask for a permit from the Indians when they came here? So this attorney is melting down and says that. And here's, I'm going to quote it because if I paraphrase it, you'll think I'm making it up. Here is the actual transcript of what Saunders said in answer to that question. No, he said, we killed the Indians off and conquered them because we were stronger and more aggressive. And if they rise again, I'm willing to do that again. His ability to conquer, he explained, derived from, quote, his superior intellect and physique. That is why we are here. We are superior people, and we should be proud of it and use it well. And I am not ashamed of being superior to some of the people I have seen in this world. Okay. The date of this conversation, the date of that statement, 1974. Listen to you, what a great audience, boy. Every speaker, you are in heaven with this audience. Did you hear them? They are so, they are really, thank you. But you might guess 1874. Well, okay, so now you know a little bit about Glenn Saunders. And now, just to tell you what life in Colorado is like, it's a small town in lots of ways. And I have become very good friends with two ladies, Carol and June Saunders, who are his daughters. And I have lunch with them a couple of times, and it's just more than I can take in at moments like that. Okay. So uh, we've talked about that. 
this is the book, this is the only book on natural resource issues, maybe the only book on history that has limericks in between the chapters for obvious reasons. And here is the limerick that sums up Glenn Saunders and the lasting image of Denver water in much of the state. To ensure that your proud city grows, you must burden its rivals with woes. Sue till they're silly, attack willy-nilly, and yield not a drop to your foes. <laughs> or, translated from doggerel verse, under Glenn Saunders, Denver Water had 50 years of aggressive plans and actions aimed at taking water from the western slope to the front range and transbasin diversions. It was an exercise of imperial power over Colorado's western slope, and it was an era of undaunted confidence in the power to prevail and to support Denver's growth. Now, we're leaping several chapters. That goes on. Denver Water is the king of the hill. And then they put in a proposal. This is actually the best chapter title of all, No Country for Old Habits. Um, and at this era is the great reversal in this, in this agency's history. Uh, they proposed a new dam, the Two Forks Dam, which would be upstream from the Cheeseman Reservoir that you just saw and would exist, very big a reservoir, a really big reservoir, in order to accommodate more diversions from the western slope. And they figured it would take them a while. They would have a lot of uh, procedures and meetings and so on, but they figured they would prevail because they always did. And this is what they got. The Environmental Protection Agency had come into existence the environmentalists, you could see the Denver Water leadership bewildered the fact that there were these conservationists and environmentalists that they were supposed to pay attention to. Denver Water leadership is saying, well, who elected them? Who do they represent? Why should we take them seriously? So this was the outcome, a sudden full stop, a full halt for an agency that had gotten what they wanted for uh, the better part of a century. Glenn Saunders' timing, this is where for, I think a historian just has to get giddy, his very first job when he was 13 years old was as a ditch gauge watcher in 1918, the very year in which the Denver Water Department was created. He died in 1990, the year of Denver Water's first big, significant, lasting institutional defeat. Did Charles Dickens write this plot? It seems um, manipulated, but true. So, 1990, Denver Water, is, it's a very interesting moment. What will happen? I truly think this is one of the world's great case studies in a brittle institution facing big change. And here's where we get to our conclusions. I think Denver Water, people can dispute this, people do dispute this. I think it made enormous changes. It assessed its history. They appointed a new, very different leader, a man named Chips Berry. He thought about the history. I think that was key to his actions. He took up conservation. He took up negotiation rather than litigation. He was really quite a different person. So now we are going to start off with some, uh, start off and then conclude recent with some conclusions here. I worked on this project and many things that I thought I understood about Western water became questionable to me. One or two of them that I'll mention here were things I told classes of students. And I don't seem to have been 100% accurate in some of the things I told those students. I thought, should I put an ad in the New York Times that says, I am very sorry, but, well, especially when we get to the business about the Eastern United States, I don't know what to do. It's a, it's a dilemma. Um, but here you'll see some of these, these changes. And I guess I do want to accent here that I do think we see in Denver Water a recognition of improbable fatalism challenging recent change. If we say, oh, an institution is just the, this way and it will never change, we don't know that. Okay, so here are four mistaken assumptions and better assumptions, and then I'm through. Um, well, I'm not through. You'll have questions, and I will be here. Uh, okay, so here is an idea that I'm sure I believed, I know I believed, 10 years ago, Western water manager, managers, in the arid west especially, have been and always will be unshakable believers in the power of humans to control nature and overcome the constraints of physical reality. I would have, a little bit of a Chinatown mode, if you want to see the people who just say, we're coming through, we're taking what we want, go to see water managers. Well, better assumption. 
The historical legacy and current circumstances of Western urban water utilities have transformed a number of their managers into becoming unusually pragmatic, realistic, and innovative and creative people. Those are words I would not have used with the term water manager. I'm very popular among water managers now, as you can imagine. Our one, one wonderful man came up to me and he said, I'm so glad you wrote this book. I said, oh, thank you. He said, you don't know what it's done for my marriage. <laughs> what could that mean? He says, he says, my wife read the book and she says, now I know what you do. So I thought, wow, <laughs> marriage counselor, wow. Uh, so, okay, so a couple of examples. Well, and this is, this is Glenn Saunders, as he was, and this remarkable man, Chips Berry, who had a madcap sense of humor. He, had, uh, he got advertising agencies to do wild things at, at sporting events in Denver at, at, in the halftime. A toilet, a person dressed as a toilet, will go running across the field, and people will be running after the toilet, and the scoreboard will say, don't let your toilet run. So... <laughs> And actually, uh, if someone wants to ask the question about what else did Chips Berry do in the way of amusing advertising, there's one I won't give you now, but it's really, really funny. So, what a change. Oh, there's the toilet. <laughs> what, I mean, look, and what a nice, hi, don't chase me. I'm, okay, um, and then, okay, so now it's really much more substantive than the toilet. These are quotations from water managers in Colorado. The Colorado River District is sort of the western... Southern, southwestern corner of Colorado, um, and Eric Kuhn is the general manager, uh, engineer's engineer. Look at this historical perspective here. What we need to do is design our environment to reflect the desert environment and not to try to recreate the eastern environment, the green places that came to Denver those, that back in the 1800s and 1900s. And this is not just Denver, but Grand Junction on the western slope as well. It's not just an east slope, west slope issue. It's a basin-wide issue. It's Let's adjust. Let's look at our past and let's adapt and let's adjust. And then this is Jim Lockhead, who is Chips Berry's successor, uh, the CEO and manager of the Denver Water Department. This is a statement I've heard him make many times um, in situations where other people are in our, the contentions of our time, going back and forth in a badminton game of dispute. This is what Jim says when they say to him, what do you think about climate change, global warming? He says, we are in the business of managing and providing water. It would be irresponsible not to deal with climate change. He does not go off uh, that statement to causality and how much has human caused and so on. He just says, we're water managers, we pay attention. Mistaken assumption number two. This was a pretty common Mark Reisner's book, Cadillac Desert. Uh, this idea that power over water in the American West has been concentrated in the hands of a small, centralized, well, the drop tox, a somewhat there, just toxic elite. I thought that. Probably said it to my students. After the Denver water case study, I have a better assumption. The acquisition, development, allocation, and management of Western water have been processes characterized by much more by fragmentation and competition I would just go ahead and say, if more than the exertion of centralized power, the image of centralized tyrannical power exercised over Western water is an imprecise match to history. Glenn Saunders fought with the Bureau of Reclamation, he fought with Interior, he fought with, well, Glenn Saunders fought, I guess that's kind of an obvious, obvious thing, but this notion of the centralized empire, the rivers of empire, uh, is a phrase of a book that, it's a wonderful book and an interesting, important book, not quite a match to what's happening on the ground and the kind of contest that's happening over any particular basin. Another, this is the biggest one. This is one I need to take out my ad in the New York Times. I told hundreds of students that the variation in water supply, those, that opening map we saw of the aridity on the other side of the, west, of the 100th meridian, that that variation in water supply had made the western United States and the eastern United States fundamentally utterly different in the management of water. Okay, then I made the mistake of looking at New York City. New York City had a few streams, a couple of springs, but the water, the river water on either side, of course, has been contaminated by seawater, so it's not, there's river water coming in the vicinity, but it's not, it would be water that would require desalinization to treat. And so very early on, the New York water system 
went out of basin and reached into the interior, the Croton Reservoir in the 1820s, 1830s, and now, of course, up to the Adirondacks. This is a New York City water system that has a weirdly western look of that reach into the interior. Here's another western town that has some of those same patterns. It's not a western town, but it does have a reach. This is the uh, Massachusetts Water Resources Authority bringing water to the Boston area. At one point, they reached into the uh, Quabbin watershed. They drowned a couple of towns to create the three or four towns, I think. Very western behavior, and yet telling us that when you pile a bunch of people in one location, you are probably going to exceed the available fresh water supply, and you are going to engage in a western kind of activity of reaching into the interior. So. Sorry, hundreds of students who I misled by not telling them that. Uh, a better assumption here from all this is that when it comes to the water manage to water management, the western U.S. and the eastern U.S. have a lot to say to each other. Again, if you pile people together, you're going to exceed the supply. And really, the occasions for regional uh, conversation are very good and not as limited as I often thought they were. And then the last point here. Um, You cannot go to a Western Water Conference without someone quoting this statement. And it's usually the despairing act of somebody who realizes he or she didn't prepare a way to end the speech. So they say, well, you know, I'm going to close off here, but this uh, brings to mind that thing Mark Twain said, oh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we checked with the Mark Twain papers people at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and they have no evidence that Mark Twain ever said this stupid thing. <laughs> and yet it's cited as evidence, or as, as the quintessential summed up remark, that water is fated to produce conflicts, contests, and even wars because it is so important to every enterprise and undertaking into human life. So that assumption that water is inherently <laughs> An unending source of conflict and bitter fighting. First of all, Mark Twain doesn't seem to have said it, and the idea is questionable. So here is an interesting story. A woman named Wendy Barnaby was, she wrote a successful book. Her publishers, her editors said, oh, we have an idea for you. This is more than 10 years ago, I guess they said, would you write a book on how that statement you hear often that the next wars are going to be about water, not oil. So they said, would you do that? Would you write a book about international conflicts that have become dangerous and violent over, over water? And she said, okay, I'll write that book. So she signed the contract and she went out and started looking around the planet and she found really more cases. She certainly found cases of bitter conflict, but she found more cases where water was too important to fight over where nations that really could not get along on matters of immigration or matters of uh, border signing and so on, they would collaborate on water because it was too important to fight about. So she went back to her editors and she said, well, I can't write the book I said I was going to write, but I could write a really interesting book on how water can sometimes, in a pretty big way, and numerically significant way, it can induce cooperation, collaboration, negotiation. The editor said, oh, we don't think the American people would be interested in that. So she wrote a short article instead, and this is a quotation from her, it would be great if we could unclog our stream of thought about the misleading notion of water wars. So a better assumption is, yes, some conflict, but also something so important that sometimes it does bring out better behavior in contestants. So if Mark Twain could do a re rewrite of a statement he never made, there are so many groups meeting these days in facilitated workshops on watersheds and so on. So we're fine. There's, this part was the accurate part of the statement. Whiskey is for drinking. OK, that was right. But water is for brewing coffee to be served at facilitated stakeholder meetings to negotiate acceptable compromises. So Pike and Long. They did not seem like the world's greatest prophets when they said the area we are visiting at the base of the Rockies, well, all across the plains and then to the base of the Rockies, too dry for American settlement. It will never happen. Didn't get that right. 
But we seem now to be in an era of serious reckoning with the water supply and how best to manage that water supply. Denver Water uses 2% of the water of the state of Colorado to support 25% of the population. Anyone interested in agriculture is noticing there's a problem with that because the people in Denver eat food and food produces that, that water. So there's a kind of ongoing, excuse me, water produces that food. There's an ongoing agricultural water transfer. Every strawberry in an urban uh, grocery store is a water transfer. But it is a still, it's more interconnected than oppositional if you look at the actual dynamics of how many people are supported by such a small percentage of the water and how the essential market, it's very much what Elliot was talking about, the farms rising to support the urban population. So I am now inclined to feel more respect for Pike and Long than I did for many years. So they have an error bar of two centuries in their prediction. Not that they were right that water would be so limited that we could not settle in the West, but maybe they were right that it was a really uh, important reckoning that would happen at some point when the American people said, this is the water supply, this is how we will have to conduct ourselves as a democratic republic to manage that supply intelligently and for the long haul. So that's one cheerful conclusion, isn't it? So thank you very much for listening to this. So. So my, uh, this is my moderator, who will now moderate me, <laughs> will keep me under control here. Okay, uh, so we're gonna go ahead and take some questions. After the questions, I'm gonna give you some details about lunch, so please give me a few seconds after we finish. Uh, and thanks, Patty, for a talk on water that was anything but dry. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. You set it straight on Mark Twain, and I appreciate that. I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the great Oklahoma sage, Will Rogers, who once said, always oh. drink upstream from the herd. Oh, I'm sorry. What did Will Rogers say? Excuse me. Wait, what did, you, did you just quote Will Rogers, or did I miss that? Yes. Oh, could you quote him again? Will Rogers once said, always drink upstream from the herd. <laughs> okay. Will Rogers once said, always drink upstream from the herd. And he really said that, because it sounds like Will Rogers. Oh. No, he was wrong, uh, because it goes back to engineers. If you do not have a well-trained group of engineers, always drink upstream from the herd. And if you were a cow, cows do not go to engineering school, so that is going to be a limitation for the herd. But if you have engineers, always drink downstream from the water treatment plant. And given Giardia in the mountain streams of the West, drink from the cup in which you have put the water treatment caps on that. So I get that, but I just, I just think the engineers are really remarkable. And water, I, this is probably where my fanhood for engineers got going. Water reuse and water treatment engineers are really something to write home about. So, so but Will Rogers, no reason why he could have seen that level of skill coming. And he, he's, I just, I don't know, to me, to have an airport named after Will Rogers, What a joy, what a joy. All right. All right. Envy is the most sincere form of flattery, so. Yes, ma'am. Those, the microphones seem to be uh, comical tricks, really. They don't seem to really amplify, but. Well, try, try it and see if we could. Oh, good. Because the water is so interconnected in the arid west, are there, conferences where all of the arid states get together and discuss a way to distribute the water? A very good question. Uh, the uh, states, whether they like it or not, are brought into the interior western states that are, that are in relationship to the Colorado River are brought into regular conferring because of that 1922 compact. In 1922, Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce, brought people together from uh, the basin states. And amazing, what people remark on, Norris Hundley used to remark on how that commission 
representing the different states, each state could send one representative and one engineer. So that was instead of the phalanxes of people you'd have from a state government. So they negotiated a compact, and it has flaws. One of the flaws is that it was negotiated at a time of high uh, river flow. So it allocates more water than there is. That's a flaw. <laughs> and yet, in some ways, that flaw has stimulated exactly the kind of conversation of, of uh, real, okay, now what do we do? And actually, in the George W. Bush administration, Secretary of the Interior, Gail Norton, really pushed California. Sorry, Elliot, but California does need to be pushed down. It was a, even in the, well, I mean, you did the stuff about some of the things that were going very badly in California. Anyway, California is a water hog. That was true. And they are now, uh, if there is a call on the river, if there is a shortfall and you have to adjust the allocations, California will now take its losses in a way that's very, very different. And it was really Gail Norton and the Bush administration who pushed California on that. So is it ideal? No. But that uh, variations in the flow have really forced intense conversation. I think it's an example of what I hope there will be more of in natural resource issues because, for instance, Air is even worse than water at respecting state borders. So I hope there will be more and more of those kinds of state-based consortiums. So it, there's a very humorous thing. I just have to say this because it's too funny that Jim Lockhead is uh, the head of Denver Water, and he is very knowledgeable, probably the most knowledgeable person on the Colorado River Compact and central to its negotiations. A friend of ours, William DeBuise, went on a raft trip on the Colorado River with Jim Lockhead, who's a physically very vigorous person. So Bill DeBuise had, I guess, his smartphone there. So he sent us all this video of the manager of Denver Water, who has to be very diplomatic most of the time. Well, he's on an outing. He's walking across uh, the Colorado at, uh, in, the, in the lower, flatter parts of it. As he wades into the Colorado, he raises his hand and he says, I claim this whole river for the city of Denver. <laughs> which then went a little bit viral. And I'll, I have to say, by the way, this is one of my predecessors in writing about natural resource history in Colorado, so she should be sharing some of these moments here. So, okay, I will be much shorter. I swear to you, I'll be much shorter in the next uh, answer. In the back, sir? Desalination. What promise does desalination hold for alleviating water shortages? Uh, did you... The, the question was about whether desalination... Oh, desalination. Yeah. I'm sorry, excuse me, that's, uh, yeah, desalinization is expensive, and it is uh, very energy dependent. So this is a really good point to bring up, that the way we have organized our cognitive world and our specializations and professions, the energy people would be having an event somewhere else while we were talking about water. And in fact, the water and energy people should be in the same conversation because your question goes directly at that. If we figure out tolerable, affordable, uh, long-term energy, then desalinization has some, some real possibilities. But at this stage, it seems so expensive and so much one of many contesting forces grabbing at our energy resources. But it certainly is in the toolkit. Uh, our wonderful colleague and comrade in Western history, Maria Montoya, has been visiting the Middle East. She's a Southwestern American historian, but she's been visiting Israel. She's been looking at places where water management is so much more intensive and it includes desalinization. So part of this, I guess, is just, well, I'm too old to be part of this, but at some point, we have to look outside the United States if we want to answer your question. We have to look at, at Israel. We have to look at places where desalinization is really much more of a, of a thing. And I cannot possibly learn another nation's history because I am too old. So I'm really glad that Maria Montoya is going to be doing that. Gentlemen, right in front of you. We waste a tremendous amount of water every day. Uh, in uh, useless things and even the manufa artificial manufacturing of food through the use of animals. Why have you not addressed that issue as to conserve yeah. water and use it more intelligently and more scientifically? The planet cannot support the, the mm -hmm. people that live on it and eating the way we do now and manufacturing food. Right. 
I didn't put it in there because I hoped you would be here in the front row and would be, <laughs> would fill in for me there. Uh, and, and point, I did have some stuff I was going to put in there. And for me, there are people in the room who know how miraculous this is. I actually pretty much stuck to my time. And that was because I dumped a lot of things at the last moment. I think that's incredibly important. And one of the things I would have said about the new Denver water is that consumption in the last, since the big drought in 2002, water consumption in Denver is down uh, close to 20% per individual. They, uh, the Denver Water uh, Department created the term xeriscaping and started popularizing guidebooks on how to plant less water consumptive things. Now, the thing that I learned that I, I will, well, okay, and then, and then your point about agriculture, our friend Maria Montoya, the historian, took some of her own time to serve as chair of the board of her cousin's ditch liner company because he had a way of making sure that agriculture minimizes water loss through leakage. And so here's an historian this is the Maria Montoya fan club meeting up here today, but she went over to just take that up, not just by speaking about it, but really acting on that. So it's a huge matter. Uh, when you are on the western slope of Colorado, the residents there will condemn Denver for all of its lawns. I have been at conference rooms while people from the western slope condemn Denver for its lawns while sprinklers just threw water into the air to evaporate on the western slope. So there's a moment of looking in the mirror. I think in, in my state it seems as if we are better at condemning other people's habits than we are at looking at our own habits. So I think that's a huge part of it. And I'll just say that I don't know if this shows that I got co-opted by the project, but Okay, so I think lawns are ridiculous. And that's because I'm a very poor lawn care citizen. So I don't like lawns. And it seems like a very foolish use. I mean, unless you were raising goats, then it makes sense. However, I decided that I was persuaded by something the Denver water people told me. They said that the lawns in Denver are like kind of dispersed reservoirs for them. So if there is a very severe drought and they do not have those lawns and they have to reduce consumption starkly, it really cuts to the bone. It really means serious, uh, certainly changes within homes, but also just in the whole economy and manufacturing and commercial places and so on. So they, as managers, and I don't think we have to ratify this, but as managers, they want the lawns there so that if they have a severe drought, they can brown up those lawns and nobody has ever died from going out on a golf course and being disappointed because it was not lush. So to do something that keeps some water in the system that's a margin, I'm not saying support that, but the lawns made the tiniest bit more sense to me, even though I hate my own. And I also, this is just to show how complex the world is, I was in Idaho giving a speech to the Idaho Water and, uh, and Natural Resource Management Team, all these, all these bureaucrats, state bureaucrats. And then I was going to be on a panel after my talk with some farmers. And I thought, okay, I'm in Idaho, I am going to just go after the idiocy of lawns as a form of waste and failure of conservation. So I had a wonderful time attacking the lawns. And I was going to be on the panel with the farmers, so I thought, oh, the farmers are going to so agree with me. The first farmer comes up before the panel starts, and he says, well, you really know how to hit a guy where he lives. I thought, what happened here? He said, you know what I grow? I said, no. He said, turf. <laughs> so what a world. Okay. Um, well, I think we're going to um, go ahead and end the Q&A, but you'll have an opportunity perhaps to uh, speak with Dr. Limerick and any of the other speakers at the meals today. Please join me one more time in thanking Dr. Limerick.